Welcome to the Proclamation 2024 CTE Publisher Webinar. Um, we are so excited you're here to uh, listen to us today and uh, try to answer any of the questions you may have. Uh, before we get started, I wanna let the team introduce themselves. Um, I'm gonna start with, my name is Janet Warren. I am the Review and Adoption Coordinator. And uh, I've been in this position about a year, but I've been at TEA uh, for almost, just a little over 10 years now. We'll start with Amy Williams and let the rest of the team introduce themselves. Thanks, Janet. My name is Amy Williams. I'm the Director of Instructional Materials Review and Procurement, which means I manage the SBOE's review and adoption process, the Texas Resource Review, and um, currently anything EMAT related. So helping districts use their allotment funds. And I have been here just about as long as Janet, just over 10 years. Hi, everybody. I'm Cassandra Pignato. Everyone calls me Cassie. I am a review and adoption specialist, work very closely with Janet as my coordinator, and Amy is my director. I have been with the agency for 13 years and in the exact same position. Doesn't mean I know more than anybody, but I've been <laughs> in the same position for 13 years. Hi, everybody. My name is Steve Wilder. I work in the curriculum division at the Texas Education Agency. Um, I've been with TEA for um, 23 years. Um, however, I have worked in the, the curriculum division for the past five years. And as part of that, I have the honor and privilege of working with the State Board of Education for the TICS review of all subject areas and um, grade levels. So welcome. Hi, my name is Michelle Sudbury, and I am the statewide STEM coordinator here at the agency. And I guess I'm the newbie. Um, I'm working on my fifth year here at TEA. Um, and so we are, uh, I work with Steve. I'm also in the curriculum division and uh, happy to be here and share information with you today. Thank you all. So our overall objective today is um, to provide some CTE specific information to help inform your decision to participate in this Texas adoption. Um, we are gonna start with Michelle and Steve. They're going to give an overview of CTE and go into information about the standards. And then I will go over the next steps, including what the first deliverables are gonna be. So I'm going to stop sharing so that they can start their part of the presentation. Oh, before we start, I wanna let you know that you'll have the opportunity um, to ask questions throughout the presentations. Uh, when we stop for any question sections, uh, you can come off mute and ask questions or you can add questions into the chat. And then if you think of a question afterwards, we'll give you a link to our help desk where you can um, send those questions afterwards. All right, take it away, Michelle. All right. All right Steve's gonna start us off. All right, so we have a, an agenda here. Um, we're gonna provide an overview of the TEKS review process. Uh, then we're going to give you information about any CT courses that are included in the proclamation. Um, I have a little presentation about understanding the TEKS and breakouts. That information we share with all of the work group members as um, that way we, we make sure that everyone is sort of on the same page and calls everything uh, the same thing. I mean, sometimes you all hear that it's the TEKS or the TECS. Um, sometimes you're, you hear that a student expectation is called a quote unquote TEK, but um, the, the TEKS are the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills. So uh, they are made up of uh, forming parts and a student expectation or a quote unquote TEK is just one of those four parts. Um, then we'll give you an overview of, of what the work group did and then we will provide you more specific information um, for the programs of study for the CTE courses. All right, so we're going to start with the TEKS review process. Just letting you all know, the State Board of Education, with the direct participation of educators, business and industry rep representatives, empl and employers, adopts revisions to the TEKS. Um, the TEKS review process takes usually about one to two years from start to finish. Um, the CTE TEKS were first adopted in 1998. Then we had a revision in 2009. 
Um, there was another review in 2015 where all 16 career clusters in place at that time were included in, in the review. Um, at the time, there were about 300 courses that were reviewed and um, the State Board of Education thought that that was an enormous lift. It was an enormous lift both by, by um, teachers, by, by the people who work group members and TEA staff. So the board decided to um, go through and um, split it up in, in different ways. For this CTE revision, that we had 45 courses, 45 of that 300 courses that were reviewed um, and revised. So there are some parameters that the State Board of Education um, can and cannot do. So um, by law, the State Board of Education may not adopt rules that designate a methodology that's used by a teacher. They also may not adopt rules that designate time spent in order to teach the standards. Um, and then also state law requires that the college and career readiness standards are integrated into the TEKS. Um, we asked the, the work group members to go through and, and align their standards with the college and career readiness standards. Um, we let them know that, um, you know, that teachers have the freedom, the autonomy to teach, to spend as, as much time as they need to on a particular um, student expectation or knowledge and skill statement. So we have an overview of the TEKS review process. It is on our website. Um, there are initial steps that are completed by Texas Education Agency and the State Board of Education. As part of that, um, TEA will post an application. That application was posted for CTE in December of 2020. And then um, we collected all of the applications that were sent in. We got about 600 applications for CTE. Uh, we provided those applications to the State Board of Education and the State Board of Education made determinations and approved the, the people that they thought uh, were qualified um, to serve on a, on a committee. Then in March of 2021, uh, we began convening work groups and those work groups um, we divided up into the programs of study and um, then they began drafting uh, student expectations. Um, we, after, after the, the work groups finished their draft recommendations, uh, we provided uh, content area experts that information. Um, those content area experts gave us in the, uh, what they thought about the, the standards. Then um, we convened, uh, then actually we shared that with the work group members also the State Board of Education had a discussion item, and um, the discussion started in June of 2021 for most of the, the standards. Um, then we convened final work group meetings. Those final work group meetings um, happened between June and September of last year, and uh, they addressed anything that the content area experts thought needed to be addressed. And um, then we began the rulemaking process. We had a first reading which for the most part was in September of 2021. Then the, the second reading was in November of 2021. And, and as I said, for the most part, the State Board of Education approved the standards um, for, um, for the, the CTE courses. We did wait for education and training and also um, cybersecurity and uh, education and training. The second reading was in April of 2022. Uh, there were some refinements that the work groups needed to make on those standards. And then um, at the same time, all of this was happening, we had technology applications going on and uh, for K through eight. And um, so we wanted to uh, wait to convene the cybersecurity group and the computer science group to align the standards with uh, the technology applications TEKS that were being developed at the time. And so cybersecurity and uh, computer science, they went to second reading um, in June of 2022. So um, I think this is you, Michelle, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. So we've um, made a list of all the courses that are included in Proclamation 2024 and their implementation dates. Since the courses um, were adopted at different times, they have different implementation um, 
depending on if instructional materials were needed for um, the course kind of depends on on how long uh, the 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 um, lead in to those implementation dates are so it can get a little confusing when you look at all of these courses so we did put it together for you here in one place um, for education and training we had six courses that came up for review um, they do have different implementation dates and those are in parentheses there for you The next area was in health science. Uh, we had a lot of courses. Um, I want to point out if they have an asterisk next to them, then these CTE courses also count for a science credit. And so we have several on this screen that fall in that category. The next two, we had hospitality and tourism. There was one course and you can see there, it, it does count for science credit. And then we had law and public service, which also had one course uh, that counts for science credit. And then in STEM, we had quite a few. And you will also notice in STEM that we have some courses with two asterisks. And that is a course with TEKS that are scheduled for adoption in June, 2022. Uh, and so just as Steve was mentioning, uh, we did hold some of these courses to make sure there was uh, alignment with the K-8 technology application TEKS. Um, and so these that have two asterisks have, were adopted in that June, uh, 2022 meeting. Uh, so they are an, on pace, but we did want you to see which ones were at that later meeting. And then our last group here is energy. These are all brand new courses. We still wanted to highlight them for you. Uh, they were not revised uh, this in this batch because they're brand new. So we have five new energy courses. So one of the things that we have is in, in um, all of our standards are codified in the Texas Administrative Code. Um, the CTE courses did exist in chapter one, 130 in the Texas Administrative Code, uh, but we found out that through the revision and, and process, we were running out of numbers, section numbers for all of the courses that we have. So a decision was made to move um, chapter 130 courses over to chapter 127. And we named chapter 127. 127 was um, the TEKS for career development. We renamed it to, uh, to the TEKS for career development and CTE. And the State Board of Education in 2019 asked to, um, to move over things incrementally. So when a uh, course is revised, um, we're moving not only the course that it exists with, from 130 to 127, we're, we're actually moving the whole subchapter over. And that was to avoid confusion. Um, that way, uh, districts, teachers, and the general public know where to go if, if they have a, a new standard and they're not having to toggle back and forth between 130 and 127. Um, so as, as the CTE TEKS are revised and adopted, they will move over to chapter 127, but, um, but the stuff that, that we're leaving alone, we're staying in, in 130, once it gets revised, then we're moving the whole subchapter over. Um, so all of the, the CT courses in Proclamation 2024 have completed their review and the newly adopted courses are no, now located in Chapter 127. A way that you can find this information is go to the main TEA website, and that's tea.texas.gov. And um, sorry, Michelle, can you move? Oh, yep. Yeah. Um, so there are buttons underneath the TEA logo. And um, those, if you have your cursor up above on the button, then it goes to academics. And um, right under academics, there is the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills or the TEKS. You click on that and that brings up this page. You have um, the TEKS by chapter. If you see chapter 110 is ELA and it progresses all the way to chapter 130 for CTE. And um, then if you click 
we offer this either in a web or a PDF version. If you click on, on the web version, then this will come up. And this is the Texas Administrative Code. And as you see, this is the uh, Tickets for Career Development and CTE. And we have subchapter A and B, middle and high school, for career development. And then we have subchapters G, I, J, M, and O. And those are all of the uh, career clusters that have been uh, uh, part of the, uh, the revision process for this cycle. All right, so now moving on. Um, as I said, this is a little uh, training that we provide to the work group members. Uh, it's understanding the TEKS. And um, just to let you know, the TEKS are what their standards that are adopted by the State Board of Education. And they're what students should know and be able to do at, at every course and or grade level. Or grade level. Um, the TEKS consists of four main parts. There's implementation, general requirements, the introduction, and the actual standards. The standards are divided up into two parts. Uh, one is knowledge and skill statements, and the other one are the student expectations or SEs, some people like to abbreviate. Um, for the, something new that has happened before is um, the implementation was its own section, um, but because, as, as you saw in Michelle's slides, uh, because these are all being implemented at different times, um, we have included the implementation date actually in the standards for the course. So if you click on a course, the first part of it will be A, implementation. And implement implementation will list when the course will be implemented and then designate whether a course should be part of a proclamation. Um, so each of the CTE courses begins with uh, the implementation section. The next uh, section are the general requirements. General requirements, they provide information regarding, regarding course credit. And they also list any required prerequisites or recommend, recommended prerequisites or co-requisites for the course. Um, this is probably beneficial for you all to, to know. Uh, that way you, you can know what a student should have been exposed to and should know uh, if they are moving into a course that has a prerequisite. So you should keep, keep that in mind with all your general requirements. Um, the next portion of this is the introduction. Um, it's a, quite simply a description of the content of the course and key information about the course and the standards. Introductions for CTE courses follow a consistent format. Um, the first paragraph lists um, CTE instruction. Uh, next is a description about the career cluster. Third is the, an, a paragraph that is um, a description of the course. And then the fourth one is pretty consistent, and that is uh, statements that are encouraging extending learning experiences for students. The fifth one is a paragraph we include for all uh, subject areas and grade levels, and it's an explanation of including and such as in the standards. Uh, so the knowledge and skill statements are broad statements of what students must know and be able to do, and sometimes they're organized into strands. Each of the CT courses begins with the knowledge of skill statement regarding employability standards. So, and as you see, it's number one, student demonstrates professional standards, employability skills as required by business and industry. All of the knowledge and skill statements uh, end with this sentence, the student is expected to, colon. And then we move on into student expectations. The student expectations are directly related to the knowledge and skill statement. They're more specific about how students demonstrate their learning. They always begin with a verb and they're always preceded by the phrase the student is expected to. In the student expectations, uh, we have some wording and this is very uh, important for you all to know as in instructional uh, material providers. Um, so if there is an and in the sentence, that means that everything before and after the and uh, must be included. Uh, same thing with among, uh, you, you all should include everything um, in the instruction materials. Um, or uh, you can use one or the other, and both are not necessary. Uh, there are including statements. Um, that means that the information must be included. And um, such as are only illustrative examples that follow um, what it's describing. So what does this look like in practice? In practice, we move to what are called breakouts. 
Um, so the content of a student expectation is determined using breakouts. Breakouts are the component parts of each student expectation, and they're used to determine coverage of a student expectation in instru uh, instructional materials. Um, sometimes you all probably have heard this as, as breakout, sometimes it's uh, taking apart the TEKS. Um, so here's an example that we have. Um, this is from science. Um, this is interdependence with environmental systems. The student knows that interactions at various levels of organization occur within an ecosystem to maintain stability. The student is expected to. That's your knowledge and skill statement. Then we have your student expectation. Explain the significance of, of the carbon and nitrogen cycles to ecosystem stability and analyze the consequences of disrupting these cycles. So there are three breakouts for this specific student expectation. The first is explain the significance of the carbon cycle to ecosystem stability. The next one is explain the significance of the nitrogen cycle to ecosystem stability. And then finally, we have this and statement it starts with the verb, analyze the consequences of disrupting these cycles. So for this student expectation, we have three different breakouts that, that are included. Uh, next, we uh, go into um, another example. Um, the student develops management skills for agriculture sources, resources. That's your knowledge and skill statement. Next, you have describe and perform hazardous analysis and follow safety rules. So you don't have to, um, well, don't break out lists joined by ant. So, um, so that is basically what happened. The correct way to do this is um, you describe hazard analysis. That's your first breakout. Your second one is perform hazard analysis. And you, the, the third one is follow safety rule, uh, safety laws. Uh, have another example for you. Um, there are exceptions to the ant rule. There's always exceptions, right? Um, this next one is decide between replacement, maintenance, repair, and reconditioning of agriculture vehicles and machinery. So because you have this between statement in here, you're asking students to decide between replacement, maintenance, repair, and reconditioning of agriculture vehicle, vehicles. And um, the second is deciding between replacement, maintenance, repair, and reconditioning of agricultural machinery. All right. So have one more. You do not need to break out any lists that are joined by or. So we have evaluate the reliability of information from informational texts, internet sites, or technical materials and resources. Um, this is not the way to do it. You're not evaluating the reliability of number one, information from informational texts, number two, information from internet sites, number three, information from technical materials. But rather, you're, um, there's just one breakout for this student expectation um, because you have this uh, conjunction of or. All right. All right, so do breakout lists uh, introduced by the word including. So here's another student expectation, demonstrate positive work behaviors and attitudes, including punctuality, time management, initiative, and cooperation. So the first breakout is demonstrating positive work behaviors, including punctuality. Then you move on to including time management, including initiative, and including cooperation. So anything that's followed by such a statement, as I said before, is used as an illustrative example. So here's another example of a student expectation where you're investigating the role of latent heat in phase changes in food production, such as crystallization and condensation. So um, the breakout is actually everything before the such as statement. So really it's just investigating the role of latent heat and phase changes in food production. All right, so then we're gonna move on to what our charge was for the work group. So all work groups are given uh, the all our CTE work groups are given the same charge. They were to review um, the standards that were currently in place, unless it is a new, uh, brand new course. They are to assure that there is a high quality set of standards uh, for each course, and those standards should prepare students for uh, post secondary education um, and career opportunities. So um, 
that everyone received that charge and are expected to um, keep that in mind as they're looking at uh, the standards that they were revising. They developed recommendations uh, for revisions to the TEAPS. Uh, they update the standards to align with current technology, research, and workforce needs. So as you know, we revise standards about um, every 10 years. And so there, especially in CTE, uh, we see lots of this technology um, and needs as the industry changes. Uh, we wanna make sure that our TEKS stay aligned to those needs. So we ask for them to um, look at what has been um, stated previously and add any current information. Also, we do a gap analysis, uh, and this is conducted uh, through a, a company that we work with called Calibrate. During that process, we look at job descriptions um, and talk with industry professionals for each of the careers that our pathways lead to. We ask them to identify skills that are needed then we look at our TEKS and do a gap analysis and figure out which skills are currently addressed and which ones are not. And then our work groups get that information and they are able to determine which of the skills um, could be embedded into our courses. The next step is um, if we are looking at a coherent sequence of courses, um, in our work group, especially if they are doing multiple courses, we want them to look at those courses, make sure that um, they are aligned uh, vertically. We also want to make sure that um, anything within the sequence is leading to uh, stepping into that career or into a college experience that's going to prepare them for the career. So uh, aligned to industry needs and that the program of study um, is coherent. And then establishing that solid bridge, like I said, to post-secondary, um, to training, to careers. Uh, uh, we look at industry-based certifications, how courses could embed um, skills that would also align to that. For our TEKS work group, uh, they are um, charged with ensuring that they have streamlined the TEKS. Uh, we wanna make sure that we are not duplicating information in a sequence of courses. We don't want a level one course to contain, um, or a level two course to contain um, a lot of the level one course information. We want it to build on the information they received in that level one course. So streamlining, um, in that regard. We want it to be rigorous. So looking at our verbs, making sure that our verbs are scaffold from level one to level four courses. Uh, we want our verbs to be observable and measurable. So we don't want vague standards that um, an educator does not know how to measure. Uh, we need them to be essential. So um, are all of the standards leading to those critical skills um, that a student needs to enter into that field. Um, is it teachable in a time allotted? So um, do all the standards, are they going to be manageable for an educator to finish in one year? So this again leads back to that streamlining, making sure uh, we are not repeating information and that a, a teacher has enough time to um, cover everything at the depth needed to be career ready. We wanna align across subjects um, or programs of study. So uh, we see this a lot, I'll use computer science as an example. There's a lot of algebra one in the course. And so looking at the standards, identifying what, what math or what other content area skills are needed, and then considering when is that information taught all of that um, helps a work group determine whether something needs to be a prerequisite or a co-requisite, um, as Steve was talking about earlier. And then we want our standards to be clear and well-written. Uh, we don't want vague standards. We want everything to be very clear so that a teacher can pick those up um, and teach what the work group intended. For um, existing courses, 
our works groups looked at the existing TEKS and revised, um, they have the freedom to reorganize. Um, they can add, they can take um, standards out based on all of the criteria that we've already um, talked about. New courses um, based on current approved innovative courses. So we have some innovative courses that uh, become courses in a program of study. Um, and so those would uh, be revised. The newly developed courses, um, a new course that's been recommended for a program of study, and then new courses that had not previously been recommended for a program of study. All right, and our next section is the course revision overview. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Steve here. So on our website, um, the, um, the CTE division has, has made these programs of study um, charts. Do you wanna talk about that real quick, Michelle, before sure. we get into sure. it? Absolutely. Um, each program of study has um, a, a page that looks like this. Our districts um, can choose which courses they are offering for level one, level two, level three, and level four. Uh, courses can be moved up. So if a district wanted to offer a level two course as a level one course, they could do that. But they could not offer a level one course as say a level three course. So you can always make things more rigorous, but you cannot make things less rigorous. So those are kind of the, the baseline rules of the program of study. Um, each area like this one is early learning. And so you will notice that in each um, section, there are uh, multiple courses that are listed. So a district can pick in this case from two different courses they offer. Um, and then the arrow indicates where um, a revised course from this um, revision period that we're discussing falls. And so for this early learning program of study, um, the only course in this program of study that was uh, worked with for this was a level two course. Actually, um, I think one of the one of the arrows, child guidance, was also one part of it. Oh, level you three. missed an arrow. Apologize <laughs> for that. <laughs> All right. So um, the first one was about early learning, um, the program of study. The second one is about teaching and training. Um, so one of the things that happened is that the work group members, uh, there were three courses, uh, child development, child guidance, and human growth and development. They were in the human services cl cluster, but the, the work group members said that it made more sense to move them over to these two programs of study. So therefore, uh, they removed subchapters and they became part of the education and training subchapter sub in chapter 127. Uh, we'll provide you um, for the next few slides with high overviews of what each of the groups did. Um, so for example, in education and training, uh, as I said, they moved the child guidance, child development, and human growth and development into the education and training program of study. Uh, they reviewed results of the gap analysis that's talking about um, the gap analysis that Michelle mentioned earlier um, that they worked with, with with Calibrate. So they reviewed the results of the gap analysis to align uh, necess the necessary required knowledge and skills into the program of study. Uh, the group also revised course requirements to better scaffold knowledge and skills throughout the course sequence. Uh, they revised the TEKS to increase rigor and better reflect careers in education. And then finally, they updated the standards to reflect current practices in the field. So this next section is about health sciences. I neglected to mention earlier that uh, the State Board of Education decided to very recently uh, revise the health standards. Um, and then they decided to revise the science standards. Therefore, um, we thought it best to revise the CTE health science standards also at, that, at the same time or very close to it. So this next section is um, <clears throat> all about health science. Um, 
the first section, the program of study is in health informatics. There really weren't a lot of uh, courses that were available for students in health informatics. Um, there were a couple of uh, courses that um, the work group revised, uh, including medical terminology, um, however, uh, and also healthcare administration and management. Um, so moving on, the, the group decided to actually develop some new courses, uh, one of them being, <clears throat> excuse me, healthcare administration and management, and the other one is medical coding and billing. So that's a level three and a level four course that they added. Uh, the group also decided to rewrite the course that's world that was called World Health Research, and they changed the name of the course to World Health and Emerging Technologies to better reflect what was uh, covered in the, the new knowledge or the new TEKS for that course. Uh, the next group was a, a work group that dealt with uh, healthcare diagnostics. You see, um, we have this medical terminology, medical microbiology, science clinical, anatomy and physiology and pathophysiology. So this group uh, went through and revised the standards for those courses. Um, so they worked on three courses, actually, um, anatomy and physiology, health science theory and pathophysiology. They used the gap analysis study with industry feedback to ensure that the essential knowledge and skills were aligned with practice practical classroom experiences and available teaching and technology resources. They also added specificity to the student expectations um, to assure that students have the required knowledge to prepare them for the workforce. And I'll add here, Steve, you'll notice on this slide, there are more arrows than what Steve just went over. And that's because those courses um, also fall in other areas. So these arrows indicate um, on that very first slide where we showed you all the courses that have been revised, um, anywhere they appeared in the programs of study, which sometimes they appear in multiple programs of study, we went ahead and added those arrows for you. Um, <clears throat> the next one is about therapeutics. Um, so you see the arrows of everything that was revised. We, we tried to make them as close as possible to, to what was advised, but the um, PowerPoint doesn't work in very, very well with us. Um, so this group um, discussed any current workforce needs and developing course content systematically. They considered district staffing and course offerings, um, prerequisite decisions and course entry points for students. I also examined technology implications and ongoing changes that have an impact on the alignment of course, content, and student skill development in the field. Uh, finally, uh, this program is studying nursing science. Um, the work groups met, there weren't, um, this was actually identified as, as a major gap that was missing. And so nursing science became kind of a, a new pr program of study and the work groups uh, worked on developing two new courses that were added to the program of study, um, that is leadership and management in nursing and practicum in the practicum in nursing. Uh, they also conduct a comparative study of the courses in the nursing science program of study to ensure that new courses were not duplicative of course content, created a cohesive sequential pathway to advance the development of standards across the program, giving special attention to pathways to attaining industry certifications and continuing study in nursing science. Um, the group also recommended cl clinical ethics, which was an innovative course be included in the nursing science program of study. All right, in the next area, I'm gonna pick this up. This is where we enter into our STEM cluster. You'll notice the color um, changes on the slide. That is um, all of the program studies are color coded. So every color that you see represented uh, represents a different program of study. So in case you're wondering or look that up on the CTE uh, website, you will notice those green ones are gonna count towards a STEM endorsement. Uh, we looked at biomedical science had uh, their courses fall in level two. They reviewed the vertical alignment of the principles of biosciences, biotechnology one and biotechnology two courses with the goal to better prepare students to meet industry needs. 
Um, again, this would mean removing duplicate information and making sure that everything was included that a student would need to enter into um, that field of study. They also rearranged the course content to focus uh, the content for each of the courses and create a more coherent series of courses. And then they made changes to the student expectations to add clarity and specificity um, to the course content. Moving to um, the RED, which is a culinary arts uh, program of study, they looked at food science, which is a level four course. As a reminder, this course also counts for science credit. They adjusted the course requirements to increase access to all students by allowing the course to count for both science credit for students and uh, for those students that are not pursuing the CTE program of study. So to, to kind of explain this a little bit further, if you look at this program of study, typically a level four, three and four courses have that prerequisite that say you have to have taken a level one, level two course in order to enter in to the higher level courses in that program of study. What we found was um, some of the courses that count for science credit, students wanted to take the course. However, they were not in a program of study pathway. They just were interested in food science and wanted to take that course. Um, and so the work group um, removed that requirement so that um, more students would be able to take the course. And you'll see that across um, quite a few of the programs of study um, that we, that is being allowed now um, for students if they're not in a CTE uh, pathway. They also looked at the course, aligned the coursework with industry positions and certifications. And the, um, you'll recall I mentioned the industry-based certifications earlier. Um, and so this work group, that was one of the things they aligned food science to some of those industry-based um, certifications a student could take at the end of the course and earn that credential. And then they streamline the course to prevent duplication between the courses um, and then uh, providing the knowledge and skills necessary for a, a thorough grounding in food science. The next one you'll notice we changed color again. This is the law enforcement program of study. And this was a level four course. Uh, the work group worked in forensic science. This is also one that counts for science credit. They updated the information about strategies, techniques, and technology, and also equipment that is used in uh, forensic science. They made the course more in-depth and focused on robust knowledge and skills for students, especially in the area of possible future occupations related to the course and its program of study. They refined the language regarding scientific inquiry to meet the new science teaks. Uh, you may or may not know that our science standards were also adopted um, during this uh, review, not CTE, but happening at the same time. And one of the big changes in science was to the scientific and engineering practices. And so since this course does count for science uh, credit, they, the work group did look at that and aligned to um, that, uh, the new language in that. And then they added detailed information regarding the knowledge and skills to make it easier for teachers uh, to use the TEKS. Um, and so that, that clarity and again, specificity really helps new teachers if um, they're brand new to the course and teaching it for the first time to really know uh, what they're supposed to be doing. Cybersecurity, you'll notice um, is green. This is one of our STEM courses. Uh, this was a coherent sequence that they looked at. So we had a level one, a level two, a level three, and a level four course. Um, they did use um, the Senate Bill 64 recommendations uh, as part of what they looked at for cybersecurity. They also um, looked at that alignment, like Steve mentioned earlier. So the cybersecurity group um, really spent a lot of time focusing on, on the alignment. They updated um, each course to reflect current career language. This is a pretty new program of study. 
Um, and even being new becomes outdated pretty quickly. And so they really were forward thinking in making sure that the language they were using would not date the course. Uh, they increased the level of rigor in all the courses from uh, defining and applying information. So before there was a lot of um, defining terms and understanding cybersecurity, but not really doing cybersecurity. And so um, they increased the level of rigor by changing those verbs so students were practicing um, the skills that they were learning about. They updated standards to reflect industry feedback on the missing information and that, that would have come from that gap analysis. And then they aligned terminology to better align to cybersecurity careers. They also added a risk assessment strand and then focused on industry alignment, which included artificial intelligence, zero trust, and modern cybersecurity strategies through system thinking and behavior analysis. Um, another STEM area was engineering. This looked at also a coherent sequence of courses um, with a level one, level three, and level four. They took a deep dive in the review of the engineering design and presentation and engineering design and problem solving to make sure that the courses were true standalone courses and were not duplicative. And so we saw these two courses had a lot of overlap. And so a district offering uh, both of these courses to students were sitting through a lot of content they already had. And so they worked um, hard on defining both of those courses. They updated the knowledge skill statements and student expectations to include learning objectives more aligned to um, the engineering disciplines such as um, aerospace, electrical engineering, civil engineering, mechanical engineering. There's, there's so many different fields. And so making um, these student expectations inclusive of all. And then reviewed vertical alignment with the level one to level four courses. And again, making sure that those are scaffold and building um, throughout in rigor. And then we have uh, the programming and software development uh, program of study. This one um, is our computer science program. Uh, they looked at four courses, uh, level one through level four, and those were fundamental of computer science uh, computer science one, two, and three. What they did in this work group was started with the level four course. So they started in uh, computer science three and then worked their way backward to that level one course. Uh, by doing this, they eliminated all um, duplication within the four courses. And they also made sure that their verbs were scaffold. And so in the level three course, the students are um, doing more of the design um, and versus in fundamentals where they're doing more of the base, um, just terminology, learning how things work, and then the application as they build through the courses. They also changed the computer science one course requirements to uh, make it more accessible to students. Uh, previous to um, this revision cycle, computer science did have a prerequisite of algebra one. So if a district did not offer algebra one in eighth grade, that limited um, the students who were able to take computer science one in ninth grade. Um, this was a barrier identified uh, by the field we heard and the work group um, acknowledged that and changed the requirement to a co-requisite. So where um, they, they acknowledged the need for algebra one knowledge for computer science one, they felt it was reasonable that the student learn algebra one at the same time as computer science one. Uh, so this was the big, that was a big change uh, for the computer science pathway. And then as Steve mentioned earlier, this was one of the, the areas that was held for the June adoption uh, because the work group was brought back together to look at K-8 technology application TEKS 
At that time, um, they really focused on the middle school leading into high school, making sure uh, that what students learned in eighth grade, that fundamentals wasn't too big a jump. Um, and so they did make some recommendations for eighth grade language to align. And then they um, took the high school courses and made some um, changes in fundamentals, especially to make sure that they were bridging uh, the knowledge between the two sets of standards. And then energy, this was our area where we had some new courses we told you about. You'll notice the color changed again. Oil and gas exploration and production is this program of study. Our new courses that were added in here uh, were, uh, or that were in the revision were level one, three, and four. And highlights for this course, since this was a new course, we wanted to give you an overview of what the course actually was because the, there was no revision that happened that these new courses were added. Um, in Foundations of Energy, students study a variety of topics that include energy transformation, the law of conservation of energy, energy efficiency, interrelationships among energy resources and society, and sources and flow of energy through the production, transmission, processing, and use of energy. So well, as the course would indicate, the foundation of the energy and what they need to know. Um, next is a level three course, remember? So there's a level two course in the middle there, and then level three in oil and gas production three. And in this course, they, they um, really focus on hydraulic and pneumatic systems and the skill requirement to work in the oil and gas and related industries. So this is typically a junior level course. And so getting students ready for what would be expected in the, the field uh, if they enter into this uh, career. And then the final uh, course in this uh, pathway, this is a level four, oil and gas production four. The course is designed to extend the training for future petroleum and engineering technicians in all areas of down and midstream operations. So that concludes our presentation on the changes. Um, if we'll answer some questions here, um, we'll take a look at the chat and, and you can also unmute to ask questions. Uh, but after this webinar, if you come across in your studies, you have questions, please submit those to the Instructional Materials Help Desk, and we'll drop that link into the chat for you. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment so we can answer questions. Yeah, this is Deborah Noakes, and um, I assume, again, we'll receive the recording of this presentation like we did with the, during the last webinar. Um, I did notice on the slides on several of those, like education and training and health science, they did list, of course, a lot more courses than you have on the proclamation. So will teachers be continuing to use what they presently have that was adopted in 2017? Will they be purchasing off list on those titles? You know, some examples were uh, principles of human services that was on education and training slide, uh, health science, principles of health sciences. I think I saw introduction to culinary arts, which none of those were on the proc, uh, but there's still courses that are going to be taught. So will they be using what they adopted in 2017 or will they be purchasing off list for those? So as a reminder, when uh, Steve began the presentation, he mentioned that uh, the courses come up for revision and bundles. Um, mm -hmm. And so the courses that are listed on the, the programs of study that were not revised in this time period, um, they haven't come up for revision yet. So the teachers should be um, implementing the, the standards that are currently adopted for those courses. And when they come up for revision, then they would be added to um, a proclamation if one is uh, issued for those revisions and the student or the districts would purchase at that time. Okay, so I have sorry. a little bit to add to that. Yeah. Um, we did intentionally leave some of the newly revised courses out of the proclamation 
Um, typically it was either because there weren't significant TEKS revisions. So although they were revised, it wasn't something substantial enough to really require new instructional materials. And in other instances, they were for very, um, for courses with low enrollment or courses that we felt it was very unlikely we would actually get any bids for. Um, for example, the practicums. Right, that makes sense. Um, and sorry if I missed it. So again, how are those, how do they determine what bundle of courses are going to be on the um, proclamations? The board does have a review and adoption cycle. And I know right now for CTE, it just says CTE. So that's not very telling for those of you who produce right. CTE materials. Right. Um, but uh, Jessica mentioned in the chat that in one of the upcoming meetings, we are going to be having that discussion with the SBOE to determine which areas of CTE they want to include with which proclamations. So just stay tuned for more information about that. But it's okay. all tied to when the TEKS are revised. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, you know, we we develop specifically for taxes. And so the longer we have, the better quality we can provide you. So, um, yeah. And so that is, the, are the ALPS for the courses that have science that can be used for science credits? Have those become available yet? What ALPS will be needed for those courses? The ALPS themselves haven't changed. So you do have access to uh, on our breakouts page, which uh, we can drop a link in the chat to that. Um, what we are doing though, is reviewing what we had previously designated for science with the ALPS and just making sure that we don't need to make any revisions. So um, when we're posting breakouts for CTE and all the other courses in Proc 2024, we will also post updated ELPS breakouts if we decide changes are needed. Okay, and basically we're working off the ELPS now that are listed, so. Um, yes, Okay. those are the All ELPS. Right. So those are the ones we're gonna use, just, yeah. you know, um, there's certain ones that we say, you don't have to cover this one in instructional materials, but you have to cover this one, or we may say, you don't need it in student materials, but you do need it in teacher materials. And so it's those types of designations right. that we're reviewing. Right, okay, thank you. Sure. There is a question in the chat. Are the industry are their industry credentials students are expected to receive with the cybersecurity course? That would be um, a question for our CTE um, division, and they could, they would have more information about the skills that were identified and uh, needed. Okay, so that question can be submitted through our Instruction Materials Help Desk, and we will um, get it to the CTE team to answer that question. Okay, and Jessica, I apologize. I didn't let you introduce yourself at the beginning. Would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Because I noticed you answering questions in the chat. Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> I'm decent. Um, yes, hello everyone. I am um, the director of special projects, and that's the team that supports the State Board of Education's process for written revision. So I work closely. Steve's a member of my team, and um, so you will see us in in other meetings um, for other subject areas. Right. Thank you. All right. Are there any other questions about the standards um, before we move on to the next steps? Uh, I have a question. Uh, will publishers be provided with the CTE breakout documents when they are completed? We will post the CTE breakout documents when they are completed, and uh, we will send out notification through our review and adoption listserv when the breakouts are posted. Okay, and an estimated time when they'll be um, available? To publishers? Um, yes, it's in the chat, but also I'm going to talk about it in a minute. Um, they are, we're expecting courses that are, um, that were adopted in April of 2022 or earlier. Uh, we expect to post those by the end of August. And then our, we're going to attempt to post the breakouts for courses adopted in June by the end of September. But that also depends on when they have made it through the rule, um, the rule revision process and are posted on, the TEKS themselves are posted on uh, the website. Okay. Jessica, you. do you have something to add to that? 
I actually was not related to the to the breakouts, but I was going to chime in a little bit to the question because I saw an additional chat about certifications, and I just want to um, talk about a little bit about the approach when we're um, looking at standards for K twelve um, in particular in high school in this instance and those certifications. So our courses are not developed to lead into or to prepare students for a particular certification, um, whether or not a district wanted to use that coursework as as a part of a training program and and had that goal or objective for their students would be determined locally, um, but it's it's not an outcome or, or a specific alignment to a certification for any of our teak space courses. Certainly our industry professionals, our educators um, look to what is the essential knowledge and skills and do consider some of the skills um, that might be included in a part of that certification just because it is, again, the essential knowledge and skills that students need to um, pursue post-secondary opportunities in that area, um, but it's not an, an, a specific or a required alignment um, as a preparatory course or that that's an outcome or a requirement of that coursework. And I, I was also going, I was looking through the chat. Um, I saw Abby's question there um, and just it follows up with what Jessica was mentioning. It's a district choice what industry-based certifications are offered there is no requirement or expected um, IBC. And so for that question, are the industry um, credentials um, students are expected to receive with the cybersecurity course? So the answer to that would be no. It's a district choice if they wanted to offer an IBC uh, for cybersecurity. Any additional questions before we move forward? All right, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so now we're going to talk about next steps. Uh, before we go into what those next steps are, I wanted to um, show you the list of courses again because uh, Michelle showed them in uh, her slides, but I wanted to point out that uh, when we had this, the single asterisk, it's uh, for the courses that the students will get science credit. That's important because those courses will be required to cover the ELPS. And uh, also, because uh, on that first slide, there weren't any with double asterisks, but the ones with the double asterisks uh, are ones that were adopted in courses that were adopted in June of 2022. And that's important because those courses have different due dates uh, for some of the deliverables in the proclamation. And I'm going to point those out in some of my next slides. So one thing I wanted to uh, mention again, uh, or mention, that is that the uh, TEA will present the Proclamation 2024 Questions and Answers document to the board in September. And the Q&A is used to provide official direction and clar uh, clarification by the board. The, um, so if there are specific questions you have or need further clarification on any of the requirements, please submit them by Friday uh, so that if it's needed to be on that question and answer document, we have it available um, that we can take it to the board in September. Not every question that gets submitted will need to be on that question and answer document. Um, and there is a previous question and answer document still posted on the TEA website for Proclamation 2022, um, if you wanna see an example of what that document looks like. Okay, mark your calendars for December the 5th, because that's the first uh, publisher deadline for this proclamation. Uh, it's for the statement of intent to bid, and that's the publisher's official declaration of intent to submit materials for adoption. Uh, the statement of intent to bid must be submitted for each product and each course or grade level uh, for which you intend to submit materials. It has the basic uh, information about your submission, such as the program title, the estimated TEKS percentage, the media format, and the system requirements. 
um, publishers that um, do not submit a statement of intent to bid by the deadline will not be eligible to participate in the process. And we're gonna email a link to statement of intent to bid training. Um, we do encourage you to submit statement of intent to bid, even if you're still on the fence about participating in the review and adoption process. Um, you'll have the option anytime within the process to withdraw, but you will not be able to participate if you miss that initial deadline. We ask that publishers use a specific process to demonstrate where in their materials they align to the TEKS and the ELPS. We've developed a web-based application called the Standards Alignment Dashboard that you will use for uh, that purpose. When you identify um, a single piece of content that covers a standard, it's called a citation, and the complete collection of citations uh, for a specific uh, course or grade level is called, um, called correlations. So you'll be granted access to the standards alignment dashboard to begin your work on correlations after you submit your statement of intent to bid and after the breakouts are entered into the dashboard. Um, I'm hoping to have the statements of intent to bid available uh, by next week, but we are still entering those breakouts or creating the breakouts. So it'll still be a little bit before you'll be able to uh, start working in the dashboard. We will provide training on how to use the standards alignment dashboard to enter your programs and your correlations. It can take several months to complete your correlations, so it's crucial that you allocate sufficient time to complete that work. We ask that publishers submit a preliminary correlations early on in the process. So for most courses, that's gonna be on January the 9th of, of 2023. Uh, this provides us with an opportunity to review a small sample of your correlations and provide feedback um, for improvement. The preliminary correlations for courses with TEKS adopted in June of 2022 are not due until April of 2023, April 10th. The next thing that's due would be your complete descriptions. Um, a complete description provides more detail about the components that will be used to verify the TEKS coverage. Uh, the complete descriptions must be submitted for each product in each course or grade level. Complete descriptions require, um, are required for each media format, and it requires more detail information about your submission, such as the program and component title, um, the ISBNs, preliminary pricing for each component, the number of print pages intended for the student use, and the system requirements for all digital components. And if you notice, the complete descriptions are due on March the 6th for most courses and May the 30th for those with TEKS adopted in June 2022. Pre-adoption samples are your fully developed product that will be used to review uh, by reviewers to determine standards alignment coverage. The pre-adoption samples are due at the same time as the complete descriptions. Pre-adoption samples must be complete electronic versions of the final product and must include all content, components, and features intended to be in the final product, not just the content identified in the correlations. So for example, all the student and teacher materials, um, diagnostic tools, test banks, et cetera. Pre-adoption samples will be posted to the TEA website for public review. The original pre-adoption sample must remain available and unchanged until the final post-adoption samples are submitted in March of 2024. All edits made after the pre-adoption sample is submitted must be carefully tracked. Prior to the pre-adoption sample deadline, the fully developed product must go through um, an editorial review. The certification of editorial review is due at the same time as the pre-adoption sample. And conducting that review prior to submitting your pre-adoption sample will minimize the changes that are needed 
to the product throughout the review process. Electronic samples must be free of sales marketing materials, um, must allow for multiple simultaneous user access, must be equipped with a word search, and contain embedded correlations that direct users to the content cited for standards alignment. There are a few other requirements that I'll point out on this slide, um, but you'll find the full list of deliverables and other requirements on pages 18 to 27 of the proclamation. Publishers must provide information regarding their product's interoperability and ease of use for review by the board and by districts. The information will be um, posted to the TEA website. And then for the affidavit of authorship or contribution, um, publishers must list everyone whose name's listed as an author or contributor and include uh, in general terms, the involvement which each author or contributor um, to the development of the materials. Publishers cannot submit instructional materials that have been authored or contributed by a current TEA employee. Um, these two deliverables are due on March 6th for most courses and for courses that are adopted in June of 2022, they're not due until uh, May 30th. Okay, so here are the next steps that you need to take. Um, you're gonna review the Proclamation 2024 handbook. Um, that is coming soon. We're hoping to have that um, sent out in a listserv with, uh, very soon, within the next uh, couple of weeks. And then you'll review the CTE breakouts when those are available. Um, like we said earlier, we're um, intending to get the courses, the breakouts for the courses adopted in April 22 or earlier, uh, posted by the end of August, and then attempting to post the breakouts for the courses adopted in June by the end of September. Um, let's see, you will need to review, um, you will need to submit any questions for the proclamation 2024 to the help desk. And if it's um, in detailed questions about the, the TEATS, um, you'll wanna submit those as well and we'll get uh, our curriculum team to help us answer those questions. And then you'll need to watch for the statement of intent to bid training um, being sent out in an email that will help you uh, know how to submit that statement of intent to bid. And then once you have that training, yeah, you can go ahead and start submitting those statements of intent to bid. And if you haven't done so already, we suggest that you sign up for the review and adoption listserv so that you can get uh, valuable information throughout this entire proclamation process. Okay, I'm going to pause there for questions. So please come off mute if you have any questions or you can drop them in the chat. So just to clarify on the digital samples, um, the digital sample, does that have to be on the platform that the final adoption program will be? Or does it just need to be, can it be a flip book of the text if that's where all of the teaks are addressed? Um, it does not, the, the platform I believe can change. Amy, correct me if I am incorrect on that. Um, so it, it doesn't have to be on the final platform, but the product itself needs to be fully developed. You need to have all the content, all of the pieces fully developed and ready for the review or for the pre-adoption okay. sample so that it can be reviewed. Um, I see here in the, in the chat, it says complete and fully functional, which I assume if our, our title, our program is going to be in some sort of lab, we would have to sample pre-adoption samples would need to include that entire lab uh, to be considered fully functional. Yeah, I'm gonna drop the exact language from the SBOE rule into the chat for you to see um, okay. regarding samples.
I mean, there's certainly more in this in this section about samples, but that's the piece that actually gets at what you're asking. Okay. Okay, any additional questions? Yes, I submitted a question. If a publisher is going to bid a program that is print and digital, and the citations are unique to each program, uh, do two separate um, submissions have to be made, one print and one digital, with two correlations and two descriptions? Or would the correlation be blended with both uh, print and digital citations? Amy, you would want to submit, but so you would submit one statement of intent to bid, two complete descriptions, one for the print, one for the digital. And then when we get to correlations, we'll talk to you about how to flag the differences in the print versus the digital in terms of just like finding the content. Okay, thank you. So Cassie's going to drop a couple links in the chat if she hasn't done so already. One of them is going to be the help desk link if you have any questions after this meeting and uh, would like to submit them. Uh, the other is going to be an exit ticket because we really um, appreciate your feedback and uh, would like you to let us know, um, answer the questions in that survey uh, so that we can have that for future uh, meetings. I see another question in the chat that I don't think we addressed and it was related to the editorial review. And so I just want to clarify that what we mean when we say that you have to certify that you've conducted an editorial review is that you and your staff have reviewed the materials um, have done a, a thorough check to catch grammatical errors, punctuation errors, errors of fact. Um, and corrected those prior to submitting your pre-adoption samples. And one of the reasons that that's so very important is that once you submit that sample, you can't change it. So if it's full of mistakes, that's what's gonna go in front of the state review panels and um, would not make a good impression. Additionally, you have to track every single change, including adding a comma or correcting a spelling or whatever it is. You can't make the changes, but you have to track the changes to show the SBOE what you intend to change in your materials in the final version. So the less you have to track in that regard, the easier for you. Hi, uh, this is Christine. I'm the one who just who asked the question about the editorial re editorial review, and thank you. Um, so just to be clear, if we just have to say as uh, the publishers, you know that that it's been copy edited and proofread, and so we certify that that's all been done. Yes. yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. If we missed anybody else's question in the chat, please come off mute and um, alert us. Uh, I have one more question. Uh, it was mentioned that the CTE breakout documents will be posted upon completion. Uh, I think it was the end of August and September. Um, and then someone had put in the chat that an Excel tool will no longer be available. Will the breakouts that are posted be available as a downloadable document that publishers can use um, as um, a, a worksheet? They will are be downloadable? posted as a PDF. Um, we no longer use Excel in any way related to standards alignment. We create the breakouts in the dashboard and um, export them. So uh, it looks, I'm gonna try to find one that we've created recently and link it just so you can see if you're, if you've used to, if you're used to seeing the, um, the Excel versions, then these are gonna look very different. Here's uh, health, which is the first review we did in the dashboard. 
and you'll see that it's uh, in more of a, a list form rather than in a table. So if you wanted to put it in some other format, you would have to do that. I see. I I see the difference. Sure, it, it's a list, um, yep. and the um, Excel document was extremely helpful for uh, publishers to track the um, citations, type of citation, location, etc. So this is just uh, a new way of relating this uh, the breakouts to us. I see. Are there any final questions before we stop the recording and end our meeting for today? We thank you for your time today. Again, if you think of any questions afterwards, please submit them through the Instructional Materials Help Desk and we will get those answered and um, have a great afternoon.